Hey everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have my January wrap up. The first of them was 84 Charing Cross Road by Helen Hamp. Sarah of Heart of Hearts ran her read along of this book on the 1st of January and I always forget how short this book is but it always brings a smile to my face. One thing that always sticks in my mind with this book are powdered eggs and nylons and the whole thing with the nylons was emphasised when I watched the film See How They Run a few weeks ago because even in that film characters are getting excited over a drawer full of nylons that they found. This is one of those quintessential readers books, a book about the love of literature and just it's so full of character. I'm very glad that Sarah hosted the read along again but I do think that it could easily turn into an annual tradition for me to keep reading this on the first day of the year because it is simply short and sublime. Then I read Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout which is the fourth in the Amgash series and this is set during the Covid-19 pandemic. Lucy's ex-husband William is a scientist and can see where, how things are going so decides to get his daughters to go and sequester themselves somewhere and takes Lucy off to Maine. Now I should have guessed at this point that this means that a lot of Strout's other characters from other books are going to appear in this one and you don't have to have read those other books it's just if you have you're going to appreciate seeing them and she really uses this book as a vehicle to check in on all of her characters experiencing the change that happened through the early months of the pandemic and she also examines the relationship between Lucy and William again. I was talking about this book with Charlie of Charlie Brook Reads and how I reached about the 220 to 230 page mark and had this sort of realisation that I'd become so almost attached to Lucy that I was beginning to think of her as a real person and I think that that just goes to show the strength of the literature. It isn't trying too hard to be literary. There is something I always say underneath the prose, you can always sense how Lucy feels about something, but it's written in this fashion that makes her, well, she's always amenable to the reader, but builds this connection with the reader. I just adored catching up with these characters and I do look forward to returning to these books and just returning to these characters and getting to meet them all over again. And yeah, I'm just thrilled to have read this one. It was a good start to 2023. Then I read The Five Petals of Elderflower by Angela Topping, which is a poetry collection, which a month later, I can't really remember that well. And I've just realised it's absolutely caked in dust. At the time, I appreciated the way that Topping utilised sound within her poetry, which is something that I've talked about very much liking when it comes to poetry. One of the things that always gets me, it does it in literature as well, is thinking about the way in which the lines are going to sound, the rhythm, that sort of thing. And that's definitely here. Um, I also appreciated the way in which Topping brought us along to um, tell us stories about her family, taking us on a bit of a nostalgia trip through recent history. Um, but as I say, I didn't really find it memorable enough um, and I couldn't single out a poem for this review. Then I read Maureen Fry and the Angel of the North by Rachel Joyce. As you can see, started my year with very short books. And this is another sequel to The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. And in this one, Maureen, after the events of Harold Fry and 10 years later is embarking upon a journey of her own. Maureen isn't walking this journey, she's going by car and it felt apt to examine how Maureen would make the journey. You get the sense that she is making the journey to achieve the sense of peace that Harold has managed to find having taken the same journey a decade earlier. However, Maureen is not the same character as Harold Maureen is more acerbic, more angry with the world and that is the way in which her grief has manifested and if you've read Harold Fry you know what I'm talking about. And it's strange that 
I felt this connection to such an acerbic character um, because it made sense as to why she would close herself off from the world, why she mistrusted certain people because you have to think about the life that Maureen would have led in comparison to Harold. We, you know, Harold's a man. He would have had it a lot easier than Maureen has had it in her life. If you think about the roles that these characters were meant to play throughout their lives, then you begin to understand why Maureen behaves the way she is, the way she does. And the end of the book, despite it being incredibly short, is it's like when you know a storm's going to come, is how I'll say it. And then the storm finally arrives and it's this unleashing of relaxation really, the pressure's off and um, you start to feel the chill again, it's no longer so humid and you just feel a little bit of glee about it and even though it was starting startlingly upsetting to read this climax, it made perfect sense and I was glad that Maureen was able to find this sense of relief. Release. Just realised I talked about a character as though they were real. Whatever. I forgot one book there. So before Maureen, I read The Tale of Toxic Positivity, a parody by Beatrix Pottymouth and Paul Mars. And Paul Mars is taking the characters from Beatrix Potter, giving them new names and just making them swear a lot and talking about the... how toxic, toxic positivity is. So we have this rabbit here. Do you know what? Most things you have to put loads of effort into are a waste of fucking time. The next book I have is The Maidens by Alex Michaelides, and I understood why people didn't like this book. This was a birthday gift from my mother and I didn't understand why she'd purchased it for me. I said to her, I don't buy thrillers. She's, um, she left me this note saying she specifically bought me this book and another book because she didn't think I read this genre. I read this genre, I just told her. It's a one and done type thing for me, so I don't buy them new. This book cost eight ninety nine. I could have had this book several times over, borrowed from the charity shop or borrowed from the library or paid a quid for it. So, And the thing is, I'm never going to read this book again. And having read it, I can understand why people didn't like it. I'm putting it down so that I can have full use of my hands. So in this book, you have the character of Mariana Andros, and she goes to investigate um, the Maidens at Cambridge University when they start dying. The Maidens are a group of girls at Cambridge University who are all handpicked by Edward Fosker, a um, professor of Greek tragedy, and they start getting murdered. Mariana begins to think that he must have something to do with it because she sees him as the classic misogynist. She is a psychiatrist. You know, a grieving young therapist, sorry. Anyway, I saw some people get annoyed because they'd heard this deemed dark academia. It's not. It's just a standard thriller that pulls a few more Cambridge, um, Oxford style lofty themes in there. It's a bit like Inspector Morse really, where that was set in Oxford and it's, I'd say that that's what you could liken it to really. You could liken it to the um, classic crime books that came out in the 60s to the 90s in England that would sometimes have this Greek or Roman tragedy bent on them and would use a little bit of mythology but at the end of the day they were just a standard police procedural. Here our sleuth is a therapist who um, is really sometimes getting in the way of the police investigation. I didn't like this book for a number of reasons, one of them being the final twist. I just didn't think that it was necessary at all. It came out of nowhere and I think it, um, it wasn't... I don't mind a twist if you can see the... if you can go back and look at things and think, oh, this was leading up to this, oh, this was a red herring to twist on this, and it doesn't do that. It just comes out of nowhere. It doesn't feel as though it had been properly thought through, and it felt almost Hollywood. Like, when I got to the end of this book, I felt like it was one of those awful 
television movies that I would put on on Channel 5 and watch with my grandmother and there would always be this stupid twist that came out of nowhere that they hadn't even led up to. Um, you know, like they foster a girl only to find out that she's a murderer and she wants to kill off the entire family just so that it can just be her and the mother, that sort of thing. It was just... In the beginning it was written well and I appreciated the way in which the author wrote for the first hundred pages and it was fast to get through. Um, I read the first, like I was on two pages a minute with this one, it's a breeze to get through but it really just isn't good. There is no real characterization. The way in which Mariana's wrote, it says on the back that she's supposed to be a young therapist, yet the way in which she's written makes her feel very classically dowdy. I just didn't like it. One book that I did like was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. To some people it's a shock that I haven't read this book yet because they thought that this was a quintessential Charlie book and having read it I can agree. Um, everybody knows the story. Arthur Dent is transported to space when the Earth is destroyed by accident. It's comedic. I was interested in this having watched the film before Christmas and I'm currently listening to The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, which I think, going forward, I'm going to continue to listen to the books because I do think that the humour comes across better listening to it. But this was funny to me. This reminded me about what I like from comic fantasy and comic sci-fi, and it was an enjoyable time that didn't take itself too seriously, and I like that, and I like the characters, and I like that really all Arthur wants is a cup of tea and I look forward to going back and re-exploring these works in future because it's looking at sci-fi tropes and it's just looking at them humorously, it's taking the Michael, it's taking the proverbial and I'm here for it. And then I read Christmas Lights, 10 Poems for Dark Winter Nights which is just load of different poems and I'm probably going to read it again in December. It was just that it came in the post and I wasn't going to wait a year only to be disappointed if I didn't like them. I don't really know why it's Christmas lights. I don't really know what they have to do with Christmas at all but they exist and we'll see how I feel in well 10 months time. Then I read Limber Lost by Robbie Arno. And this was a huge disappointment for me. So in Limber Lost, we are getting the story of a young man's summer where he is killing rabbits to raise enough money for a boat. And it's following his life on his father's farm uh, in New Zealand or Australia. My issue is this story lacked all of the magical aspects that I've come to expect from Robbie Arno's prose and it was really a story that I have seen so many times before. So many times in fact that when certain things were happening I could see where the story was going to go at least a hundred pages before it had happened. I knew what was going to happen, I knew what twists were going to be, I knew um, what sort of emotional strings the author was going to try and pull with this one and unfortunately there just wasn't a strong enough like narratorial voice that um, I could forgive that. Like had there been anything in that voice that I found different or I found appealing then I could have forgiven the predictability of the novel but it was just so basic and so generic that I left it feeling incredibly disappointed and disenchanted with the writer. And then we had uh, The Private Lives of Trees by Alejandro Zambra and I'm not sure how Fitzcarraldo is going about publishing these books. I have uh, no idea whether it's related to Bonsai in any way except for the fact that um, the character in The Private Lives of Trees is writing a book about a man with the same name as one of the protagonists in Bonsai and he also has a Bonsai tree so we have that um, theme, uh, that uh, motif appearing once again and in this one a man is concerned because his wife hasn't arrived home 
and now he is running through his mind about their lives together. It's an incredibly short book and <laughs> I can remember saying at the time that I really enjoyed it and uh, how I felt this connection with the character and I like the way in which Zambra writes. But again, I read this now a month ago because after this point my reading really did slow down. But I read this a month ago and I cannot, for the life of me, remember anything more about it. But maybe that's the thing, maybe because it has been a month I would need to go back and refresh myself as to this story and it's just because I'm trying to remember details about a 70 page book a month later. Then I read Broken in the Best Possible Way by Jenny Lawson and a few years ago when I was going through the period of unfathomable sadness I read Furiously Happy by Jenny Lawson and it was something that I went back to whenever I was feeling a certain type of way. When I discovered that Broken existed I went to purchase the hardcover despite the fact the book's been out for two years and this book was written during uh, the author's own period of depression and struggles with it and that definitely comes across in the writing. However, that almost makes me appreciate it a bit more because it becomes this very honest portrayal and you can see how it's affecting the author and it's affecting um, her writing and also the way in which in this book there is a very heartfelt letter that she writes to her insurance company trying to get the medication that she needs that they keep saying can't be covered and the thousands of dollars she's having to accumulate just to try and exist um, and the treatment that she needs that they are refusing to fund and I think that shining that light on the American healthcare system as well as still managing to create a relatively humorous book that in times I was just sat there laughing out loud my father was questioning what the heck was going on is just brilliant. Yes this is more of a collection of essays than a memoir with any through line but I very much appreciated it. Then I read 100 Queer Poems which is I believe it was edited by Andrew McMillan and Mary Jean Chan, I can't remember. At first I thought it was going to be all new poetry from modern poets, but it's not. It's poetry that spans, um, I'd say, about a few hundred years. There are a lot of modern poets in this, and it was only when I got to a Carol Ann Duffy poem and I recognised it, um, because I used it for one of my writing workshops, uh, that I realised that it was just this collection of poems by queer poets and it's great and I'm glad it exists and I'm probably going to go out and get a physical copy now and it's great to have collections like this, anthologies like this, where you can discover new to you poets and then if you like their work go out and explore it further and it's a great way to find the sorts of poems that you like and the sorts of poetry that you like and so Again, a great one. Then I read Orlando by Virginia Woolf and... A few moments later. Considering my video quit out there, I think that what I was going to say anyway was that I just don't feel like talking about Orlando by Virginia Woolf anymore. So I'm not going to. <laughs> then I read Prozac Nation by Elizabeth Wurzel. This is another book that I discussed in a wool gathering video. And I'll leave a link to that because I really just don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm actually going to be donating that one to the charity shop. I just wanted to show it in this video. Um, I understand the hype that surrounded this memoir, um, but it just was not for me. Then I read Translations by Brian Friel. Again, I mentioned this in a wool gathering video, which I will link. But unlike Prozac Nation, I actually very much enjoyed this script and I liked the discussions about language as well as it providing an insight into what went on in Ireland and the way that Britain tried to wipe out its language. Well, I can't say Britain, the way that England uh, tried to wipe out the language and anglicise it. And now we head on to books that I haven't got written down and I just have to hope that I have them 
all here uh, because yeah it's 12, a fortnight's worth of books, just not written down. The first of those is Cat Lady by Dorno Porter. I did mention this in another Wool Gathering video. Uh, this follows the character who's... Uh, that's it. This follows the character of Mia, who is attending a pet grief support group, despite the fact that her cat is still living. And as the book goes on, we learn why she has made that decision to do this. Um... If you liked, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, then you will like this book. What I liked about the book myself was about 150 pages in, I'd slowed down reading this, I was thinking of DNF in it and giving it away, and then what I call the great unravelling happened. And it made so much sense then from a writing standpoint that I can't believe I didn't think that this was going to happen. And then it was just fantastic to see the great unravelling happen and then the almost rewinding of the thread. Respooling? I don't know. I'm not a seamstress. But I ended up liking this book. As I said at the time, it's not the greatest book in the world, but I had such fun reading it in the end. And I think that Dorno Porter did a great job of creating these characters. And think that it would adapt to television incredibly well if but the only thing in its way is the fact that they say not to work with animals and children and there's two of them in here. I read the majority of Emotionally Weird by Kate Atkinson in January but I didn't finish it till February however I will talk about this here. This book follows the character of Effie who is telling her recent history to her mother Nora and it is Kate Atkinson basically taking the proverbial out of writing. So it begins with the manuscript that Effie is supposed to have written for her creative writing class at uni. She's a university student and she is behind on every single one of her deadlines and she keeps wondering whether she should come up with a dead relative but then recognises that she actually doesn't know any of her relatives so there's no point coming up with a dead one because all she knows is her mother who is um, apparently we learn in the beginning of this book not actually her mother but she knows nothing about who her family is and she's really trying to get blood from a stone in finding out who her actual family are but Nora isn't prepared to tell the family history. Throughout this book, you get um, the manuscripts that Effie is writing appearing, as well as interjections from Effie's mother, Nora, where sometimes she won't like where Effie's story is going. At one point, she tells her there's too many characters, so we go back to that scene and suddenly there's fewer characters there. Um, and it is just Kate Atkinson messing around. She mocks magical realism. She um, does this thing that I used to say when I was at uni, which was, um, if something didn't make sense, oh, it's just postmodern. And I just, it reminded me of what I like about Kate Atkinson's writing. And Charlie's had to hear me enthuse about this book for a week now um, because I was just so thrilled to return to this book and be reminded of what I'd liked about this book in the first place and it really did help me figure out the writing of one of my own books. If you didn't know, myself and Charlie Brook of Charlie Brook Reads are hosting the Literally Doris read-along which is running until the end of March and so in January we read the first book in my series of books featuring Mrs Doris Copeland and that was Our Doris. Uh, this is the first book in the series, as I say, and in this book, Doris is aspiring to be fifth house in a garden safari, and here we follow her exploits as she tries to achieve this, fighting against the local women's institute and her mortal enemy, Janice Dooley of Little Street, all told from the perspective of her long-suffering husband, Harold. It's important to drop the H. And... Some, we did our live show last night and I said to Charlie immediately there was one thing that I forgot to mention and that was in the I went back to this book obviously and I was reading it and a few things crept up. So one is that in the first chapter Doris goes over to see a man called Ben and asks him how Elaine is. 
I know for a fact that in the Partridge Muse world, there is a character called Ben, who's married to a detective in um, An Heir to Murder, and Ben performs as the drag queen Elaine Closure. I didn't think about that when I came up with those names, and I didn't know that was going to happen when I wrote Doris. Another thing is, we have two Mrs. Patels, and I discussed this with my mother, and she says it's perfectly normal that the Mrs. Patel, who is Doris's dentist, will also be the Mrs. Patel, who's a member of the WI, but they weren't originally meant to be the same person, and I didn't even recognise that I had done that. So Mrs. Patel became a dentist, specifically Doris's dentist, which I know is going to be shocking when we get to Indisputably Doris in February, because um, Doris might not be the nicest to Mrs. Patel in that book. Either way, them's the books, I think. I don't know whether I read anything more. If, if it's not in the journal, then it's forgotten. Um, if you've read any of these books and would like to discuss them, please feel free to do so in the comments. I hope that you've enjoyed this video because until next time, that is all.